Great. Well, I want to first of all thank uh, Basil, Leah, and all the other organizers for inviting me today into the Cambridge Palestine uh, Solidarity Society and to thank you all uh, for joining. I know we're probably at the point in the pandemic where another webinar and, you know, especially in the early evening on a Thursday isn't the most exciting thing to do, but I hope this will be a good uh, discussion. What I'd like to do uh, in about 30 minutes or so is really to kind of trace not only the findings and recommendations of our uh, threshold cost report, but also a little bit about how we got here and where we see, you know, what's transpired since and what we see as the road forward. And I really look forward to a vibrant discussion as I was telling the organizers before. I think these are the kinds of topics that I know were so influential and discussions that were very in, uh, influential in my own uh, development as a, as a university student. And I hope we can have a really um, a good conversation. So let me start out by saying, I think everybody here is probably familiar with the work of Human Rights Watch you know, across the globe. We're an international human rights organization that covers human rights abuses in 100 countries across the world. Um, we've been working on Israel and Palestine for well over three decades. It's part of our work um, across the MENA region where we cover every country uh, in the region. Um, and really the impetus for this report stemmed from a sense that our years of work we're capturing very important dynamics in particular areas, whether you know, home demolitions in the West Bank, you know, land policies inside Israel, uh, movement restrictions in Gaza, but they were failing to speak to the underlying reality on the ground. A reality in which in practice, one government primarily rules over an area. So the Israeli government ruling over the area between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, where you have Israel proper and you have the occupied Palestinian territory, so the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And in this area, you basically have two groups of roughly equal size, about you know, 6.8 million Jewish Israelis, about 6.8 million Palestinians. And where this government's policy across the board has sought to methodically privilege one of these groups, Jewish Israelis, and systematically repress the others, Palestinians, to varying degrees of intensity. Now, what I just laid out may seem relatively simple, but yet it flies in the face of what has been decades long assumptions that have guided the international conversation around Palestine, right? The idea that a 54 year occupation is temporary. The idea that Palestinians have meaningful control over their lives when the Israeli government retains exclusive control over 90% of the territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. And we're even in the remaining 10%, which is the parts of the West Bank and Gaza where Palestinians manage affairs, the Israeli government retains, um, in essence, primarily you know, exclusive control over the population registry, which controls the issuance of ID cards, the movement of people and goods, the borders, the airspace, the water space, the access to national resources, taxation, security, uh, the idea that Israel is a democracy when it rules over millions of people who are denied their basic civil rights or any say over the government that rules over them, or even the idea that a 30 plus year peace process will soon end abuses. So this report, uh, you know, more than two years in the making, uh, 217 pages, tries to understand Israel's treatment of Palestinians living under its control. It's based on case studies we conducted for this report, where we compared the treatment of Palestinians and Jewish Israelis living in the same areas or in a, a nearby areas. But it also draws on years of Human Rights Watch's research. We tried to sort of tie together threads. We also um, looked at statements and, and years of Israeli policy, statements by government officials and others. We then compared the facts that we documented against the established international law on discrimination. Under international law, there is a universal prohibition against severe discrimination. The term used under the law is apartheid. So while that term was coined in relation to events in Southern Africa, it's actually become a universal legal term under international treaties. There is a, pro there is a universal uh, prohibition, a customary international law prohibition 
against severe discriminatory oppression. There's also a crime against humanity known as apartheid, defined under the Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court, as well as under a separate United Nations Convention from the 1970s. As a crime against humanity, apartheid connotes particularly inhumane acts, so really serious abuses committed in the context of systematic oppression by one group of people over another, and where that group, the dominant group, has an intent to dominate the marginalized group, right? So inhumane acts, systematic oppression, intent to dominate. International law also identifies a related crime against humanity of persecution, which refers to uh, severe abuses of fundamental rights when combined with the discriminatory intent. At Human Rights Watch, we apply the facts that we documented based on methodical research against international law. And when we did so in this case, Human Rights Watch determined that Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution against millions of Palestinians. Our finding was based primarily on two things. I'm gonna spend the bulk of my presentation going through those two areas. The first of those is a policy that we documented across Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians. Secondly, this finding is based on the severe repression against Palestinians living in the occupied Palestinian territory. I'm going to go through each of them for a few minutes before I sort of move on to our recommendations in the way forward. So starting with the first prong of the analysis, right, which is the intent to dominate or the discriminatory intent, the first being under apartheid and under persecution, Human Rights Watch found, based on a review of laws, planning documents, um, and, and a variety of years of research, uh, that Israeli authorities have sought to engineer and maintain a Jewish majority and maximize Jewish-Israeli control over demographics and land uh, across Israel in the occupied territory. We found that this amounts to an intent to dominate and a discriminatory intent under both crimes against humanity. So here we're primarily talking about two things, right? The first is that the Israeli government has sought for years to, um, main, to sort of uh, take policies to mitigate the demographic threat as they deem it that Palestinians pose, right? So um, examples of that are, for example, for nearly two decades, the Israeli government has effectively prohibited the granting of long-term legal status to Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza married to Israeli citizens or nationals, a restriction that doesn't exist for the foreign nationals of Israeli spouses from virtually any other country. Now for 18 years, until earlier this year, this was enshrined in Israeli law. Earlier this year, the law was not renewed, but newspaper reports, including in the recent weeks and uh, findings of NGOs have shown that the Ministry of Interior continues to apply the same policy of basically preventing family reunification between Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and Israelis or Palestinian citizens of Israel, right? And this policy as acknowledged by those that passed these laws and subsequent Israeli prime ministers serves only really demographic purposes. There's a security argument pre-offered, but clearly such a widespread policy to not allow a right to entire group of people um, is on demographic grounds. And, and Ariel Sharon said basically in 2005, when this law was renewed, there's no need to hide behind security arguments. There's the need for the existence of a Jewish state. There are many other examples. This report in 217 pages lays out. Right. So in addition to demographics, the second prong of the intent to dominate is about land policies, where the Israeli government has methodically sought to maximize the land available to Jewish Israelis and to confine Palestinians into smaller and smaller enclaves. Now, this policy takes different forms. Inside Israel proper, for example, the Israeli government has a formal policy to Judaize entire regions of Israel, right? This includes the Negev and the Galilee. These two regions alone uh, you know, make up nearly two thirds the land inside Israel and where, our, where much of the Palestinian population lives. And that policy has led to numerous other policies. To take one example, right? Israeli law permits small towns and villages to exclude in effect based on one's background. And there are now hundreds 
of small Jewish towns across Israel that effectively exclude Palestinians from living there. Um, and this policy and many others like it, um, you know, are clearly meant, uh, you know, to sort of further this discriminatory policy. Inside Jerusalem, right, which is made up of occupied East Jerusalem, as well as West Jerusalem, the government planning documents lay out in plain, ter plain terms that a major objective of the municipality is to maintain between quotes, a solid Jewish majority in the city. The government planning documents lay out even desired demographic ratios and even talk about pursuing this goal through densification or thickening of areas where Palestinians live, while, of course, land is expanded for Jewish communities. In the West Bank, this policy is the most explicit, where we have decades of Israeli government policy. Let's take, for example, the 1980 Drobles plan. This has been written about, where the government in writing talks about, quote, settling the land between the Arab minority population centers and their surroundings, end quote, noting that doing so would, quote, make it hard for Palestinians to create territorial continuity and political unity and remove any trace of our doubt to control Judea and Samaria, which are the terms the Israeli government uses for the West Bank, forever. And these are not just words on paper. They're backed up by massive land grabs and infrastructure, uh, roads, water, electricity, all meant to connect illegal settlements, which are violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention, right, and war crimes to Israel proper, all of which makes clear their intent to permanently dominate Palestinians. Even in the Gaza Strip, where the Israeli government withdrew its settler population and much of its ground troops in 2005, the Israeli government since 2005 has pursued a policy of separation between Gaza and the West Bank. Our study of this policy revealed that its enforcement um, aims to largely take out the 2 million people, million people in Gaza. Gaza is a 40 by 11 kilometer strip of land, effectively off the demographic books, right? So by basically saying we've washed our hands at this small strip of territory where you have 2 million people, it allows Israel to consolidate in its books a demographic majority across Israel and the West Bank, which it hopes to retain, right? So the idea is maximum land, minimum Palestinians, and the Gaza withdrawal has been in service of that gerrymandering a Jewish majority across these areas. Let me make a point before I wrap up this part of the analysis that many of the abuses at the core of apartheid, uh, things like land expropriation, denial of building permits, um, and things blocking family reunification have no legitimate security justification, right? Um, so while Israel claims that security is its motivating factor, it doesn't explain most of the policies at the core of the crime. And even where it is part of the explanation, for example, movement restrictions, the Israeli government's method of securing these aims has been through domination, right? Through a policy that is unlawful. And the fact that security may be part of the motivating factor no more negates an intent to dominate or no more negates apartheid and persecution than it would other crimes against humanity or provide carte blanche or as it would torture or indiscriminate force. They all still are violations. The second prong of our analysis looks at the systematic oppression and inhumane acts that the Israeli government has carried out against Palestinians, in particular in the occupied Palestinian territory, pursuant to this intent to dominate. So let me sort of walk through in relatively simple terms looking at the different geographic areas, the ways in which the Israeli government's policy has sought to further these aims, right? And so starting with the systematic oppression. So when you start with the systematic oppression, you look at the West Bank. And in the West Bank, you effectively have dual bodies of law that apply to Jewish Israelis and Palestinians living in the same territory, right? So you might have a Jewish Israeli and a Palestinian who live across the street. If they commit the same crime, they are tried in different courts, Palestinians in military court, Israelis in, in Israeli civil courts, where they have different due process rights, and they can literally receive different sentences for the same crime. And this is fully sanctioned by the Israeli court system. In fact, the decision just last month reaffirmed in plain terms that there are dual legal systems and that that's uh, permissible. The Israeli government also enforces segregation you know, in the West Bank, right? So you have a reality in which um, the Israeli government prevents Palestinians from entering settlements, except as laborers bearing special permits. 
In addition, the Israeli government manages a separate and unequal allocation of land, building permits, including you know, um, uh, roads and water, right? For people living in the same territory, right? So not only has it confiscated millions of dunams of land from Palestinians, but 99% of the land that's been redistributed for civilian use, and according to government statistics, have gone to is Jewish Israelis living in settlements and not to Palestinians who make up you know, 2.7 million in the West Bank compared to you know, 400,000 Jewish Israeli settlers. In East Jerusalem, where Israel considers it uh, you know, part of its sovereign territory, but remains occupied territory under international law, many of these same dynamics prevail. So for example, Palestinian Jerusalemites do not, for the most part, have citizenship. They're stateless people. And their legal status is, is, uh, is that of a resident, the same status as a foreigner. And they can lose their legal right to residency if they move out of Jerusalem to a different part of the West Bank or, or even inside Israel, or if they're abroad for too long. While a Jewish Israeli Jerusalemite does not face that, that risk of status, uh, loss of status. Inside the Gaza Strip, since, you know, uh, for the last 14 years, the Israeli government has effectively um, imposed a generalized ban on the travel or movement of 2 million people. It's effectively caging 2 million people in this narrow strip of land. You can only leave if you fit within a narrow humanitarian exemption. So the vast majority of people in Gaza are not free, not only to go abroad, not only to go to Israel, but even to go to the other parts of Palestine. Right. Um, and in addition, the Israeli government dramatically restricts the movement of goods, and that has contributed to devastating the economy, a situation in which 80 percent of the population relies on humanitarian aid, where the majority of families spend the majority of their days without active electricity, where 97 percent of the water uh, is contaminated. Right. The kind of groundwater that comes there where um, you know, GDP per capita has been actively uh, uh, gone down since the early 1990s. Um, in addition to those areas in the occupied Palestinian territory, Human Rights Watch looks at the institutional discrimination, you know, within Israel proper, right, which manifests in numerous ways, including on many of the same, you know, areas, including the fact that Palestinian citizens of Israel, right, so even though they have the status of citizenship, actually have an inferior legal status by law because they're not nationals. Right, and their access to land uh, is quite restricted. The majority of Palestinians, 19% of Israel's population, outside of those in the occupied territory, live on about 3% of the land inside Israel proper and face numerous restrictions, uh, including uh, on planning and on, uh, uh, and they attend separate schools where they attend, they receive inferior resources and, and it displays in numerous other ways. The third and final part of our analysis looks at the inhumane acts that the Israeli government has committed in this context of systematic oppression uh, and um, with this intent. These inhumane acts also constitute severe abuses of the fundamental rights of Palestinians. Our report focused on five clusters of inhumane acts. They include uh, movement restrictions, so not only the aforementioned closure of Gaza, which I should note, again, is not a security-based policy. It's a ban on anybody's travel. So even if you qualify for a permit, let's say for a humanitarian exemption, you need a life-saving surgery. If the next week you want to travel for a vacation or for a training for your job, um, you're not allowed to do so. And again, you should be able to move between the West Bank uh, and Gaza, which even Israel recognizes as a single territorial entity, the way you might move between, and forgive my UK, uh, lack of knowledge between uh, Cambridge and London, right, or Oxford and London, right, but, but in reality that travel is effectively prohibited for Palestinians. In the West Bank, Israel imposes a permit regime, so Palestinians who live in the West Bank need difficult to obtain permits to enter large parts of the West Bank, while Jewish Israelis living in the same territory are not required. Palestinians face hundreds, nearly 600 checkpoints and other closure obstacles spread across the West Bank, where Jewish Israelis have largely unfettered movement. Pal the Israel also has built a separation barrier, which is largely built on Palestinian land and separates thousands of Palestinians from agricultural land, schools, hospitals, etc. 
That's one category from Humane Acts, the movement restrictions. Secondly, the report goes into land expropriation, right? I mentioned this a, a bit earlier, but more than one third of the West Bank has been expropriated from Palestinians using a variety of tactics the report lays out. Uh, this has reduced Palestinians to living in 165 non-contiguous territorial islands across the West Bank. Some have referred to them as Bantistans. While is, settlements are sprawling, uh, you know, and there's stark sort of inequality in, in the access to land. And I mentioned the statistic around 99% of that land being given to settlements. Third, Human Rights Watch talks about the inhumane act of forcible transfer. So in the majority of the West Bank, which is under Israel's exclusive control, as well as East Jerusalem, it is effectively impossible for Palestinians to get a building permit. According to government data from 2016 to 2018, Palestinians received 100 times more demolition orders than building permits in Area C, right? Israel has demolished hundreds, thousands, in fact, of homes, schools, businesses in this area, simply for lacking a permit that's basically impossible to get. These policies, you know, have led Palestinians to leave their homes, right? Have, have, have led to, you know, significant acts and coercive conditions that amount to forcible transfer. The fourth inhumane act that Human Rights Watch documents are restrictions on the rights of Palestinians to residency, to live in their own land. I mentioned the restrictions around Jerusalem a bit ago. But even in the West Bank, more than half a million Palestinians lost their legal status since 1967, either because they were abroad for too long, you know, or because they weren't there by chance when the occupation began. Um, and that policy applies to thousands in Jerusalem for the reasons I gave as well on similar grounds. And fifth and finally, the, the fifth and you may not human rights watch focuses on is the suspension of basic civil rights to 4.7 million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who have been under military rule for 54 years, where they don't have the basic right to free expression, assembly and association, where they can face 10 years in jail for being in a demonstration without a permit, right? For being a member of an undefined hostile organization, for hoisting a Palestinian flag. And many have been detained on, on, on these bases. The report also talks about abuses of Palestinians inside Israel proper that are quite uh, significant. For example, in the Negev, the Negev area of Israel, there are 35 Palestinian Bedouin villages that are not recognized by the Israeli government, right? Where you have 90,000 people who basically live illegally in their own homes, where the Israeli government has carried out hundreds, thousands, in fact, of demolitions, where they lack access to water, basic resources, and where you know, every day they live in terror of, of having their home demolished. This report features the most stark findings that Human Rights Watch has ever reached on the conduct of Israeli authorities. It's the first time we've found crimes against humanity committed by the Israeli government. Our recommendations to the international community and to Israel are predicated on the gravity of our findings. I won't focus significantly on our recommendations to Israel because they're quite obvious and apartheid in all manifestations of discrimination and repression. We also have recommendations to businesses, the PA, but let me just say a word about our recommendations to the international community, especially given that I'm speaking to an audience largely in the UK. We call for six clusters of major asks, all of which are aimed to end complicity in these crimes and to ensure accountability for them. They include, first of all, for states to recognize the reality of apartheid and to issue statements on that basis. There's quite a bit of denial about these crimes despite their severity. Secondly, we call for uh, the United Nations to appoint a global envoy for the crimes of apartheid and persecution with a mandate to seek the end of these crimes. We've also reached findings of apartheid and persecution with regards to the treatment of the Rohingya uh, in the Rakhine state of uh, uh, Myanmar. We've also found crimes against humanity, including persecution in China's treatment of the Uyghurs and in other contexts. Thirdly, we call for the International Criminal Court to investigate and prosecute those Israeli officials implicated in the crime, as well as countries to do so under the principle of universal jurisdiction. I should have noted earlier that we also um, called for a commission of inquiry by the United Nations into 
uh, severe discrimination based on group identity. The UN has subsequent to our report established after the May hostility such a mechanism. Thirdly, we call for targeted sanctions, including asset freezes and travel bans against those Israeli officials implicated in the crimes. Fifth, we call for conditioning all arms sales and military and security assistance to Israel on the government taking steps to end apartheid and persecution. And finally, we call for vetting all forms of bilateral engagement you know, with Israel to ensure non-complicity in the crimes, to end activities where that's not possible, to mitigate where it's possible, but to really end where mitigation isn't possible. Let me just say that findings of apartheid and persecution are not just, you know, something that, uh, you know, applies to something in the past, right? Even trying to understand recent events, the events of Sheikh Jarrah, uh, in, re in recent months, it's been in the news, stem from a similar policy, right? A reality where Palestinians who live in Sheikh Jarrah, right, where many of whom are displaced, you know, from their homes inside Israel proper, right, uh, who, who are banned by law, basically, from, from moving back to that area, right, are being forced out of their home to make room for Jewish Israelis living in illegal settlements, right? These are examples and manifestations of apartheid, as is the closure policy in Gaza. Let me conclude by saying sort of where we see the way forward and looking forward to moving into conversation with you all. A 54 year occupation is not temporary. A 30 year stalled peace process isn't alone enough to dismantle systematic repression. Denying millions of Palestinians their fundamental rights solely because of who they are, solely because they're Palestinian and not Jewish is not simply a matter of abusive occupation or an ongoing conflict. The first step to solving a problem is to diagnose it correctly, right? The wrong diagnosis, the wrong analysis leads to the wrong conclusion. Apartheid is no longer a hypothetical or a future scenario, right? It may never have. Palestinians have been telling us that it's apartheid for years or decades, and too many of us didn't listen. But there even have been warnings by Israelis and Americans. In 1974, Yitzhak Rabin, Rabin warned about the prospect of apartheid. Jimmy Carter in 2006, US president warned, peace, not apartheid. John Kerry, the, the um, secretary of state in 2014 said we were on the verge a year or two away from apartheid. The threshold has been crossed. Apartheid is the present day reality for millions of Palestinians. Don't just take the word of Human Rights Watch for this. There's a growing consensus in the international community. Um, we now have seven Israeli human rights groups, at least, including B'Tselem, the premier Israeli human rights groups, groups like Yeshtim, Karim Navot, Physicians for Human Rights Israel, that have described the treatment of Palestinians as apartheid. International, European, you know, American, other human rights organizations have reached the same analysis. Legal scholars, even in the UK, someone like, you know, Philippe Sams or Lawrence Tribe in the United States have also referenced apartheid in relation to the treatment of Palestinians. Respected commentators, right? You have folks on MSNBC. You even have, you know, a pop culture, uh, you know, icons. John Oliver, right? Uh, you have uh, just yesterday a letter published by 100 artists from Richard Gere and Susan Sarandon that talked about uh, the reality of apartheid. You have parliamentarians in the UK, you have US Congress people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and Cori Bush. Even within Israel, you have two former Israeli ambassadors to South Africa, one of whom was the head of Israel's foreign ministry that have used the term apartheid. The former deputy attorney general of Israel, current members of the Israeli Knesset. The Israeli Knesset hosted an event that I spoke at several months ago under the banner of 54 years from occupation to apartheid, featuring Knesset members in the government as well as in uh, you know, the opposition. The former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has talked about the situation arguably being apartheid. And you even have states, South Africa itself and Namibia, countries that have experiences with apartheid have used the term apartheid to refer to the situation of Palestinians. The foreign ministers of France, of Luxembourg, have used the term, the Organization of Islamic Conference, 57 countries, the list goes on. Those who strive, let me just conclude with my last word really being that those who strive for Israeli-Palestinian peace 
whatever the solution must be, should in the meantime recognize the reality for what it is and bring to bear the sorts of tools needed to end it. Thank you, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Omar, um, for that really educational and clear overview of what has been, I would argue, a groundbreaking report. Um, I think it's really useful to link the terms that we often hear being discussed when speaking about the Palestinian occupation, like apartheid, like persecution, like land displacement, linking those to concrete examples and to the research that you have done, which proves that, yes, this, this is an apartheid and a threshold has been crossed. Um, Thank you very much to the audience for sending in your questions. Just a reminder that you can send those to the participant labeled questions. Um, so I'm just gonna start off with a couple of questions that, that relate to each other. Um, so supporters of Israel regularly profess that human rights organizations such as Human Rights Watch always single out Israel. Um, what would you say in response to these false allegations? Um, in addition, in, in what ways is this report substantially different from past reports by the Office of the Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories, which came to the same conclusions that the situation in Gaza has and the Occupied Territories has constituted crimes against humanity and apartheid? Um, yeah, over to you, Omar. Thank you so much. And let me start with your first question. I mean, um... Literally, Human Rights Watch works in 100 countries, right, across the world. We apply the same methodology, the same tactics, we do the same work. Um, and, you know, many authoritarian, you know, repressive governments we work on, their recourse when they disagree with our findings is instead of, you know, attacking the findings, they attack the messenger. So you'll find the Egyptian government saying we're biased on one side or another, the Saudi government, the Syrian government, you know, you name it, they're going to say that we're biased. That's a tactic. And one of the many tactics uh, repressive governments use here. I mean, uh, even for me, right? I covered Egypt. I wrote a report on crimes against humanity committed by uh, the Egyptian military government after its coup, the killings of, of protesters. I've documented possible crimes against humanity by the Palestinian Authority, including systematic arbitrary arrest and torture of dissidents. Uh, we've talked about war crimes committed, uh, also possible crimes against humanity with Hamas, not only arrest and torture, but also war crimes. You know, our reporting talks about abuses by all parties. Uh, in the recent round of hostilities, we did a whole standalone report on rockets fired by Palestinian armed groups. So our methodology is to document abuses by all parties, right? And that's our credibility is that we um, you know, document facts and apply the law wherever it takes us, um, you know, and, and despite the consequences. And it should be noted that, um, you know, uh, I really should make note of the fact that those who might not know um, that the Israeli government has made similar accusations, of course, against Israeli human rights groups, uh, against international groups. And it's not just that. In the last, last month, the Israeli government designated six Palestinian human rights groups, uh, some of whom have been operating for more than four decades, who have won major international awards, um, who have been on the forefront of legal advocacy as terrorist organizations and effectively outlawed them, right? I mean, this is a uh, appalling and unjust system. It's been condemned across the world, but it should show you that the Israeli government um, is systematically not only assaulting um, human rights defenders, but it stems from their utter disregard for international law and international norms, right? And you know, unfortunately, they're not alone in this respect, but, you know, they, th this, these kinds of tactics are what we see the most repressive governments around the world that we work on using. Um, in terms of your second question, right, about the different reports, um, you know, I think uh, different organizations have taken different mandates, different scopes, each of which are important, right, so for, you know, and, and each of which I think add to the growing consensus. Certainly, Palestinian human rights groups have documented these issues for some time. B'Tselem, an Israeli group earlier in 2021, released a report saying Israel was an apartheid regime from the river to the sea, uh, across all areas. You know, Yeshtim looked at apartheid in the West Bank. Um, Palestinian groups, again, have looked at apartheid against the Palestinian people. UN special rapporteurs um, have, uh, are looking at this, this question. There was a UN report uh, from 2017 that looked at apartheid. The reports are different. And I, I can get into the very nuanced conversation. They have to do with the scope of the inquiry, the mandate, the evidence, the issues looked at. Some of the conclusions differ, the methodologies differ, the scope differs. 
Um, but really, when you take a step back and you look at this body of work, it's quite clear um, that apartheid is a reality, right? And let me just say something else. I've briefed dozens of governments on this report. Um, you know, there's been dozens of, you know, hundreds, thousands of, uh, you know, articles written about this report. I challenge the audience to find, you know, one report that challenges the finding of apartheid on the merits, the legal finding that says that the facts were wrong or that the, the, the facts were misapplied to the law. You won't find it. The, and this ties together the two answers to your question. You will find uh, attacking the messenger, ad hominem attacks, you know, um, Miss, you know, sort of changing the topic. Oh, it's different than South Africa. We're not saying it's the same as South Africa. We're saying there's a crime and the elements are met. Um, and so um, I think that's really telling. Thank you so much, Omar. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting to look at how these types of narratives um, contribute to the further silencing of Palestinian history and Palestinians' reality. Um, so yeah, thank you for detailing that a little bit more. Um, another question here is, uh, do you feel there is now a shift in discourse in how Palestine and Palestinians are talked about within the media, especially after the horrific events in Gaza over the summer? Um, and with comparatively increasing awareness about Israel's track record and ongoing abuses, we are witnessing a number of celebrities and athletes dropping out of performing and playing in Israel and how much influence do you think uh, this would have and this kind of shifting discourse and how long do you think it might be before any meaningful change in Israel's behavior is seen? I think it's hard to deny that there's been a shift in discourse. Um, I mean, if you look at the media coverage in May, um, a lot of it tried to understand why. Why are, we, why are these, these repeated uh, cycles happening? It took a much broader look uh, there's a term that was used in the UN uh, Human Rights Council's creation of a commission of inquiry about root causes, right? People wanted to understand root causes, right? And I think that's really important because so often the way the media talks about Israel-Palestine, it's focused on the latest event, right? And it's easy when you're in a situation of hostilities to say, well, it's rockets, but it's, you know, it's killing. And, you know, it's easy to fall into kind of uh, false assumptions about the nature of the conflict, but I think there was a deeper understanding in these events of wanting to look at the larger context of why is it that Gaza is uh, under closure, right? Why is it that, um, you know, Palestinians are treated the way they're treated? So um, I think there are a lot of data points to indicate that, and I one of them is what I concluded my remarks with, which is the growing, you know, recognition of apartheid. It's as if more people are comfortable saying what their eyes are telling them, right? I often, um, for those who are familiar, I tell, you know, I relate to the story of the emperor wears no clothes, if you remember the story, right? Where, you know, a naked emperor is walking through the, the streets and everybody is lauding his beautiful wardrobe until one brave voice says, he's naked, he's not wearing anything, he wears no clothes. And then eventually the kind of drumbeat grows. Um, Palestinians were that voice, human rights groups, civil society for so long, a lone voice in the wilderness. It's you know, part of the reason why they're being designated terrorist organizations. But over time, I think you're seeing Israeli, international, other voices, and that has created a safe space, right, for progressive lawmakers, you know, for um, you know, commentators, for academics, for so many people that always, you know, especially if you spent time in Israel, Palestine, and you do so in like a, you know, without sort of a propagandized look, but you actually like look and compare, it's impossible to not deny what your eyes see, right? And it's just so apparent, right, all around you. And so I think people feel that, you know, now it's safe to do that. And um, that's significant. But then again, you know, let's let's look at the flip side. I'm an optimist, so I like to focus on that side of it. But the reality on the ground is as bad as you know you can imagine, right? I mean, the UN years ago said Gaza would be uninhabitable in 2020. Well, we're about to turn the calendar to 2022, right? And when you look at that situation, when you look at um, you know home demolition, settlement expansion, uh, it's really a, a terrible situation on the ground. So your question is a good one: of when can we? Or can we expect changes in the framing and in the narrative to change realities on the ground? And that's the question of our time, right? That's going to be the question that and it's going to come down to whether or not governments act 
and whether or not governments act is going to be a product of the extent to which um, you know there 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 is movement and there is pressure put and there is uh, efforts taken. I mean, clearly we know that if the international community is not taking the set of steps that a situation of this gravity warrants. Uh, and it's not because the facts aren't there. It's not because the law isn't there. It's not because there isn't awareness. It's because the political environment makes it difficult. And so, you know, it's the challenge of our time. One of the challenges of our times to um, push the international community to act pursuant to these grave abuses. Um, and uh, in many ways, it's the test of the, the um, you know, the, the uh, rigor or the credibility of the inter whole international legal order, not to overstate it, because there are many other terrible human rights situations, but this is a clear situation where uh, a reality is happening in front of our eyes. It's being written about and documented. The world has for too long buried its head under the sand, failed to recognize reality, now more recognizing reality. So when you recognize that there are crimes against humanity, and let me just say the word again, crimes against humanity means crimes against me, crimes against you, crimes against everyone else on this call. And it, the world built a system to deal with that and it needs to act. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I actually have a question that leads on quite well from that. Um, that's around the potential limits of international law as a framework um, for talking about Israel and Palestine, and also just a general question about what you think the prospects are for the ICC's current investigation of Israel's human rights violations, um, whether because of those political dynamics and because of the uh, lack of action from the international community, whether that's, that's going to be limited. Um, yeah. Really thoughtful questions. I mean, let me start with the, you know, with the second one, and then I'll go to the bigger of the first one. I mean, on the second one, look, the International Criminal Court earlier this year first uh, ruled that it has jurisdiction over crimes committed in, in Palestine, so in the occupied West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, and that could be revisited later on, but that was a key procedural hurdle. Um, and secondly, the prosecutor opened a formal probe. So we now have a formal probe uh, looking into serious crimes committed in Palestine by all parties, right? So is Israeli government, Palestinian armed groups, Palestinian authorities. Um, it remains to be seen where that, where that goes, right? I mean, we have a new prosecutor at the helm, and uh, it's, it, it's another institution that will be really tested. I mean, there's, you know, um, Human Rights Watch has long called for an investigation. Uh, there are, we believe that crimes of the gravity, including apartheid and persecution, but also war crimes and armed con and, and hostilities, settlements, torture, arbitrary arrests have been committed by Palestinian authorities, by the Israeli government, and that it's incumbent upon the court to you know, move forward expeditiously and seriously with this investigation um, and to do so on the basis of the facts on the ground independently and not based on the political considerations. Uh, we have certainly reasons to be skeptical. I mean, there has been a wall of impunity that victims have faced, uh, you know, for decades. Um, this offers a window of hope, but, uh, you know, there are many legal, political, and other challenges. So I think, um, it'll, it, you know, uh, our, our, the new prosecutor, um, this will be a real test uh, of him and his commitment to independent partial justice. And if the entire, um, you know, inter Office of the Prosecutor, International Criminal Court, and to all states that claim to believe in the rule of law and accountability, uh, who conveniently seem to leave those principles often at the door when it comes to Israel's conduct in particular. With regards to your first question, again, we're talking to an academic audience, and so, I'm, you know, these are the sort of questions that you should be asking. Look, Human Rights Watch's mandate is international law. So that's going to be a set of tools that we bring to bear. Now, international law doesn't have all the answers, right? Um, you know, there is a very vigorous discussion among especially Palestinians, but also among academics around, you know, the settler colonial history that's very relevant here when it comes to the Israeli government, when it comes to its conduct, not only uh, in the occupied territory, but inside Israel proper. That's a discussion that Human Rights Watch um, has not really been a part of because our mandate is the law. Apartheid is a crime, therefore we look at it. We don't look at comparative, historic, or other frameworks, but they're really critical, right? Because I think a legal framework is a useful one. It brings something to bear, you know, but there are limitations certainly on the law, not only on what issues uh, you can talk about, but in terms of remedies, right? Ultimately, the law um, 
comes about because it's emerged through years of treaties and, and practice by states, but certainly, um, you know, it's, it's at, at, at its best, it's a bare bones, uh, you know, set of, of obligations and duties, right? And so, um, you know, it, it, you know it, the law really takes no position, for example, on war or occupation. Human Rights Watch has no position on, on wars or even on the Israeli occupation. We document abuses within occupation, such as settlements or, you know, apartheid or war crimes, right? So that's a mandate that, you know, allows us to say things credibly and impartially about a range of issues, but also doesn't speak to a whole set of other issues. So I think, uh, you know, we'd like to think our report contributes to the conversation, but certainly you shouldn't read it as the only thing out there. You should read other doctrines and other approaches, and, and I think it, it, it adds to it. And and certainly remedy wise as well, the law is going to give you some remedies, um, but it's not going to address, you know, decades, decades of, uh, you know, of policies. Look, I mean, just to add an anecdotal note, I, I'm speaking to you from South Africa now where I, I'm here for work and where the legacy of apartheid is still ever present. And while you have strong laws and uh, everything on the books, um, unfortunately, it hasn't, uh, you know, changed reality for, for millions of uh, black South Africans in particular. So, um, you know, I think it's worth noting. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, don't want to go too much down the academic route, but as someone who studies international law, I think it is always interesting to look at how it it often can't take account of asymmetry um, when looking at parties, especially laws relating to conduct in war, um, which is often the wars talked about when, when um, interrogating Israel's practices. And I think it's obviously a very useful resource. And as you have talked about in your report and now um, important to recognize historical entrenched inequality and those processes as well, those settler colonial processes. Um, so we're, yeah, we're getting loads of amazing questions. Um, I hope people don't mind maybe hanging on until 7.15, 7.30ish. Um, just wanna, yeah, I think, it's a really great chance for people to um, ask the, the burning questions they've been having about this. Um, so let me just, let me just find my questions. Okay, so um, as you know and have experienced yourself, um, the Israeli government has a low tolerance for dissent and anyone documenting human rights abuses by the state by deporting or imprisoning any inconvenient voices. Um, how big of an issue is this for any activists, medics or journalists trying to work in Israel, Palestine and what can be done to counter this? Um, and then this is linked to another question, which is what do you think of the recent suppression of human rights organizations in Palestine, especially with Palestinian organizations labeled as terrorists? Do you think this increase in suppression shows that human rights defenders are seriously threatening Israel's oppression? Um, if you need me to repeat any of that, just let me know. No, I mean, I think it's, they're really good questions. Look, I mean, the designation of Palestinian groups, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty put out a statement, you know, hours after it, it went out, which is rare for two big organizations because we see that as an attack on the international human rights movement, right? Um, you know, this is a, and I don't mean to sound uh, hyperbolic, an existential threat to Palestinian civil society, right? As somebody who's worked in many countries across the world, you know, Palestinian human rights groups have been among the most um, um, sophisticated uh, advocates uh, of human rights. I mean, Huck's been around, for example, for 40 years. They're examples of strong global South human rights organizations that are having an incredible, um, doing incredible, incredible work, right? And so literally today, as I speak to you, the Israeli government has the legal authority to go and shut down these organizations, arrest their staff members. Um, not only that, they can arrest people who support them, uh, including you know, many Israelis, internationals. Um, it's quite stark. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, these designations were made a month ago. Um, we haven't seen, I think, enough condemnation from governments. We've seen it throughout pouring across the world. From civil society, but we've seen shameful, and I say this 
shameful positions from governments, including governments like the United Kingdom, right, which, which have basically said, oh, we, we're waiting to see the evidence, right? There is no evidence here, right? It's quite clear. The Israeli government, has, we did a whole report in 2019, Born Without Civil Rights, about the ways in which the Israeli government will use um, you know, allegations that are based on basic expression, free expression, peaceful free expression, peaceful free association, right, to, um, to shut, shut down Palestinian civil rights. And in this case, I mean, I've seen some of the purported evidence that's been disseminated. It's been reported on by journalists, right? Uh, it's largely based, this claim of that their terrorist organizations is based largely on the testimony of a couple of people who do not work for any of the six organizations, who work for a different organization, who un, in detention, according to their lawyers, under torture, made very general allegations regarding these organizations. That's the evidence that is real, quote unquote, evidence that the Israeli government has. So this is a quite you know, stark um, you know, situation. And in many ways, and Human Rights Watch and Amnesty said this, this is a consequence of decades of impunity for the Israeli government that has acted that is felt emboldened to act in this kind of brazen way. Um, and it's a true test of the resolve of the international community to protect, to protect human rights defenders, right? We've worked with some of these groups for decades, like Al Haq and Al Bamir and the Defense for Children International Palestine, BSAN, um, and you know, the Agricultural Work Committee, uh, the, the, the Women's Rights Committee for, for many years. They represent the best of civil society. So this needs to be a top priority of the international community. Whatever, you know, many of listeners will know that the Israeli government deported me two years ago on the basis of my human rights advocacy, including, you know, uh, for Human Rights Watch. Um, you know, there, the Amnesty International has had staff that has faced punitive travel bans. My colleague and friend, Leitha Buziad, who whose mother died in a hospital three kilometers from his home, but was denied a permit to be at her bedside as she was battling cancer, right? I mean, they're really awful stories, but what Palestinian civil society faces today is an order of magnitude more grave and severe. And to the first question about what risk medics and human rights workers, this is a true test point too, if the Israeli government gets away. Again, two years ago when I was being deported, widely covered, I, you know, we said to the media, if I'm deported, you know, you can expect escalations, including outlying local civil society groups. Two years later, this is where we're at. Where we'll be in two years likely will depend on what happens today with these designations. Look, the reality is Israel, for much of, you know, despite its grave human rights abuses, has been a, relative, a place where most journalists and others, you know, can operate. Not if you're Palestinian, certainly you're restricted, but if you're an international you know, you've been able to go, not to Gaza, but you've been able to do so. There have been travel bans, there have been denials of entry. It's not perfect, but there has been room that, you know, maybe harder in other places. That no longer uh, is the case. I think there are significant risks. People are being denied entry every day. Uh, Israel has laws that says if you support boycotts, uh, or even if they, you know, uh, will say that you support boycotts, even if you don't, you can be denied entry, you can be deported, um, and, and many of Palestinian Arab origin or just others, um, it's happening. And there's a network of non-government organizations that work with the Israeli government to further this agenda. So it's stark. I still say all of your students, you should go. You should you know, see the situation for yourself, volunteer, work, do research. Um, you know, that it's not you know, completely closed in that sense, but you know, things are getting worse, but we need more people to go because part of the objective is to strip Palestinians of connections with the international community. They've done that with Gaza over the closure over the past 14 years. They want to do it in the West Bank. We re we're refusing it. Uh, many others are refusing it. We need to all refuse it because if we don't, it's going to happen. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I definitely echo um, Omar's advice to go and see it for yourself if, if you possibly can. Um, but also, and, and even to interact with the those the Israeli system and the deportation system is eye-opening in how much Israel wants to keep um, what is happening within its borders, um, control, keep control of the narrative. And I think that, yeah, that in itself, experiencing that is, is eye-opening. Um, of course, not a nice experience, but <laughs> um, so... Moving on to the next question. Um, next questions. 
So this one is, uh, to what extent do you think the US government is complicit in perpetuating the apartheid dynamic and human rights abuses? Do you see a shift in the US position on Israel-Palestine in the foreseeable future? And what might be necessary to bring this about? Um, this is kind of related to a, this question about, um, is it possible for apartheid and discriminatory practices to end in Israel whilst there are no, no sanctions or pressure applied by the international community, especially the US and Western powers? Yeah, so on the first question about the United States, I mean, look, it's it's quite clear that the United States long has, you know, failed to put it lightly to, um, you know, use its connection relationship with Israel to, to stop abuses. They've greenlighted, in some cases, serious abuses. They've shielded uh, Israel from scrutiny, you know, for, for, for long periods of time. So I think it's, it's pretty clear that the U.S. approach has always been in this conflict, not a productive one when it comes to human rights. Now, many people, you know, sort of focus on the Trump years as sort of some dramatic uh, deviation from U.S. policy. I mean, it, it certainly was, uh, you know, unprecedented in, in, in its sort of intensity, but it was based on the same parameters, right? Like the United States government has never really held Israel to uh, the same, you know, claims of human rights guiding policy that, I mean, it doesn't do in other places too, let's be clear, but like, you know, it certainly has been, um, you know, green lighting and and certainly in some cases, you know, outright, uh, you know, um, complicit, I think, in, in, in many of these abuses, right? I mean, for example, uh, even in these May hostilities, Human Rights Watch documented the use of U.S. weapons in war crimes, right? In actual strikes that killed, uh, you know, scores of Palestinian civilians, entire families, um, you know, and that has continued. I mean, even in the midst of those hostilities, the United, it was news went public of the United States reauthorizing an arms shipment. Um, and not just with arms, but obviously with the political support. And otherwise, the Biden administration, you know, has not fully even reversed the Trump agenda. It's it's sort of content on you know reversing part of it, not prioritizing this issue, turning a blind eye to the reality on the ground. It's as if they've turned on a tape recorder from 30 years ago and they're just repeating the best hits. You know, when the reality on the ground has only continued to deteriorate. So the United States position has been shameful uh, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, Israel-Palestine, and, and obviously it's quite critical that that changes. In terms of the second question, I mean, look, um, it's quite clear, right, that, you know, throughout, the, throughout uh, other conflicts, not unique to uh, the Israeli-Palestinian context, human rights abusers, uh, you know, do not end uh, their practices without, uh, you know, there being sustained international pressure. Right. Uh, you know, we certainly would hope that, you know, one day there's an Israeli government that sees that it's in the best interest of, of it and Palestinians and Israeli Jewish Israelis to have to not be practicing crimes against humanity. But that's not been the case. And, and, and it really isn't, um, you know, the defining issue in Israeli elections. Right. Most Jewish Israelis have no, um, you know, don't live that reality, don't see that reality, you know, and the government has built a system that. Uh, you know, shields their, you know, lives from, from, from this. And so, uh, you know, um, so when you have a situation where, you know, one population is entirely living normal lives, you know, uh, a strong economy with resources diverted to them, there is no motivation, there's no incentive to change that reality, especially if it means changing the, the political structure. So I think, um, you know, I think if we're going to change that reality, the international community needs to bring, needs to end its complicity at minimum in, in these crimes, right? So that means arms sales, you know, that means looking at bilateral agreements. Are those making you complicit in the crimes against humanity? Businesses, other actors sort of need to need to do that. Um, and that may, may well, I mean, that's about one's own human rights duties, right? Like you don't want to yourself, um, you know, be complicit in human rights abuse, but it may well provide a motivation you know, for the Israeli government to change its calculus about how it, uh, how its conduct uh, moves forward. Yeah, and um, very much related to that. Um, how do you think the common claim that Israel is a democratic state that respects the rule of law kind of relates to this and justifies um, the US support for, for Israel? 
My good friend Hagai al Ad, the executive director of Beth Salem, uh, once wrote in a piece that um, democracy is the rule of the people, not the rule of one people over another. Uh, you know, we are not a democracy or promotion organization, we're a human rights organization. It's not our job to, um, you know, determine, uh, you know, uh, what is a democracy. There are many different definitions. Uh, there are not many definitions of democracy I know that involve millions of people who have no say for decades on end over the government that rules over them and have no, uh, you know, are deprived of basic civil rights. So you have a 50-year-old Palestinian in the West Bank who, you know, almost every move is controlled by the Israeli government, has never had the right to free expression, right? Never had a chance to vote over the government that really controls their lives or, you know, to, to, to protest freely, to join uh, vibrant civil society groups. Um, and so, you know, and that's the tougher part of your question. The rule of law is quite, is quite simple, right? You have dozens of UN resolutions. You have very black letter, the, the most basic international. There's no debate about the law, I mean, on these issues, unless you're the Israeli government or the Trump administration. Settlements are a clear violation of the Geneva Conventions, the transfer of one civilian population and territory acquired by war. There's not really much buts or ifs there, right? You can't use collective punishment, which is, you know, a core part of the Israeli government's, you know, strategy, right? You can't, um, you know, there, there's so many elements of this that's just, um, you know, when, when somebody commits a violent act, right, a Palestinian, the Israeli government demolishes the entire family's home, and they don't even hide behind the explanation, right? The Israeli government authorizes use of force standards that do not meet international policing standards. Take the issue. I mean, uh, and there's no accountability. Like, look at 2014, uh, the, the war where you had, by UN estimates, 1,500 Palestinian civilians killed. You will not find an Israeli uh, one person that was, you know, actually held accountable for their actions. I think there were a couple of, you know, misdemeanors for minor fraud issues, but nothing to actually do with the underlying uh, serious crimes committed. So uh, the idea that Israel respects the rule of law, um, you know, would be laughable if it wasn't tragic. And I think I made pretty clear sort of, um, you know, uh, where I stand on the democracy question. Um, yeah, thank you. That's that's very clear. And I think also important to um, note that, that those practices and policies also apply to Palestinians living in within Israel and are treated as second class citizens. So there's kind of, there's a lot of myths around that, that there's at least equality there. Um, so in yeah so we have quite a few questions relating to bds that i'm just going to list off if that's okay um but obviously take your time to go through each one um so firstly um in south africa apartheid was eventually abolished largely due to international pressure boycotts and sanctions do you think something similar must happen today in order for israeli apartheid practices to end um yeah similarly yeah, how would you say BDS can be best applied both by individuals and states to maximize the pressure? And then relating especially particularly to Cambridge, um, the vice chancellor of our university is a human rights scholar. But when we delivered an open letter condemning Israel's aggression during the most recent attack on Gaza, he responded by effectively telling us that it was a conflict between two sides. Um, and once there was a ceasefire, that there was nothing to be done and that it was resolved. Um, how do you think we can engage people who don't want to hear about the reality for, Pal for Palestinians? Yeah, I mean, um, look, on the BDS question, um, you know, Human Rights Watch takes no position sort of on boycotts um, of any country, right? It's just not our mandate. Like you, we were mentioning the law as a tool, right? Like we, our mandate is to document abuses by actors and to call for countries or, you know, human rights, let's say duty bearers to meet their obligations. So even when we've documented, for example, Airbnb brokering rentals on stolen land, we won't tell consumers what to do because that's not our mandate. We will tell Airbnb if, you know, you're violating your, you know, international, uh, your duties under the UN guiding principles by not, by brokering these rentals, right? And, and we'll tell uh, companies not to do business with settlements because doing so makes you complicit in those human rights abuses, right? So, um, you know, but we defend the right of people to engage in boycotts. Boycotts have a long history of being used to, uh, as a tactic to end um, uh, situations of severe human rights uh, abuse and repression. 
Um, and you know, uh, we pushed back against efforts to curtail the right of people to engage uh, in boycotts, which are a legitimate form of civil you know, disobedience. And we don't take a position either way. We don't oppose them and we don't, you know, we don't uh, advocate for them. Um, you know, when it, I don't know the context, full context of the events that you know, took place in, in Cambridge, but what, I, what I'll say sort of generally, right, is um, yeah, certainly like when you have moments of armed hostilities, you know, there are, you know, there is violence by Palestinian authorities and there is that by, 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 by Israel. But I think one of the biggest fallacies uh, is this idea that this is a situation that's just a conflict between two sides that are fighting over the same thing. It's intractable. It's been going on for decades and, uh, or let's say decades is accurate, but it's been going on for, you know, millennia or something or centuries, right? Like, look, you know, I've worked on human rights in many contexts in Egypt and Pakistan and in Syria and the United States uh, and elsewhere. And, you know, Israel-Palestine, like many other conflicts, context is a modern conflict about access to land, resources, and rights, right? And, um, you know, in this, and it's a situation of structures of uh, repression and inequality, right? And so it's not that, you know, and it's, there's obviously lay layers of, you know, detail, and there are some complexity on some questions, but it's really not that complicated when it comes to the underlying reality. I mean, there's, uh, you know, apartheid is a core part of it. Uh, and again, when you're there and you see it, it's quite clear. So, too many people hide behind complexity uh, or hide behind two sides and don't want to get involved as a way to sort of not engage. And I think that's that's a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I've found that conversations often get shut down when that word complexity is is brought into them. And I think that it's reports uh, like yours, which makes it easy to refer to tangible um, reasons why this this does this is apartheid and why um, Israel is breaking international law. So yeah, it's a very useful resource to have. Um, one final question to try and kind of lead on a hopeful or inspiring note: uh, What do you think are the best things that our students can do to support Palestinians living under these unbearable discriminatory conditions and to help fight apartheid? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, look, I think that the bottom line uh, here uh, is that, um, you know, we're dealing with a situation where, you know, the Israeli government and so many, um, you know, want to pretend that, you know, uh, this doesn't exist, right? That, um, you know, Palestinian, this is a, you know, a conflict, this is a conflict, it's, it's not really taking place, Palestinians don't have legitimate claims. So I think for students and for those that are, you know, concerned, um, it's, it's critically important that you speak out, uh, that you not be uh, chilled into silence, um, you know, that as part of universal human rights work, I would hope, you know, students are concerned about human rights in many other parts of the world, but that you're vocal about this issue um, and that you call on your governments your, um, you know, uh, your universities, whatever your, you know, relevant places are to make sure that they are not being complicit uh, in, in these crimes, right? And I think you can be vocal on doing so. I would encourage people to, you know, use social media, to, you know, use your various outlets to communicate that. Um, and for those that want to get involved in human rights uh, work as a career, you know, uh, college is a great time to get to know places, to travel, to explore, to deepen your, your understanding, uh, you know, of issues. And even for those of you that are not working in humanities or human rights that might be in engineering or elsewhere, you know, there are all sorts of ways that you can contribute uh, outside of your nine to five job, uh, you know, whether it be in, in activism, you know, whether it be in you financially, whether it be in supporting uh, initiatives, you know, through uh, civil society institutions, through other through other ways of doing it. I think the key point is not to be cowed, you know, to be vocal, um, to continue. I mean, really, the hope uh, that so many have, even among you know human rights victims in Israel Palestine, a lot of the hope they get is from young people um, from universities and places like the UK and in the United States that are speaking out. That's public opinion is shifting. Um, it actually brings a lot of hope to people who live under really grave abuses. So um, don't think that the things you're doing, even your activism on your campus or in your local uh, community are, are ignored. Um, you know, these things are closely followed uh, in this context among many. And, and, you know, and I think a lot of the hopes people have for a better future, um, you know, uh, is tied to your activism. So really, I just thank you all again for 
you know, for having me uh, and for taking the time. And, uh, you know, I'm wishing you all uh, the best of exams around the corner and, uh, and, and hoping uh, we can continue this conversation down the road. Thank you so much, Omar. Yeah, and on that note, um, PalSoc is a good place to start. So <laughs> join um, our mailing list and uh, follow us on Facebook for kind of more events like this and to get involved in the activism that um, we have planned for the rest of the year. Um, yeah, just to say once again, thank you so much, Omar, for joining us for what's been a very informative um, and insightful conversation um yeah and thank you so much for all the attendees for for your time and for joining us today thank you thank you